Hey guys, it's been almost a year since the release of my first video, and I'll be honest, the production quality of it compared to my other content is pretty bad. So this video is an update that will fully cover everything you need to know with better explanations than the first video. But first, I'd like to take a moment and mention that I have a Facebook group that is slowly growing, Casey's Mealworm, Superworm, and Discoid Roach Knowledge Center. Join in and feel free to ask any questions with the larva. Eggs are laid by the beetles, which in turn take 7 to 14 days to hatch. The larva start off only a few millimeters long, extremely tiny and very hard to see. Your larva will grow over the next 4 to 5 months and reach their maximum size, being about 1.5 to 2 inches long and about 5 to 5 millimeters wide. The best foods to feed these guys are leafy greens, such as mustard greens, spinach, kale, and lettuce. These foods do not mold quickly and are rich in water, which is the biggest component that I have found to help them grow. Freshly hatched larvae will thrive when given this type of food, as it is easy for them to consume. Potatoes, carrots, and other veggies are good as well, however, they are eaten a lot slower and are better for larger larvae. If it cannot eat it within 24 hours, I do not place it in their container. I personally feed every other day and place only enough for it to last them one day. Temperature is an important thing to keep in mind. They need to stay warm. While I do not use a heating pad most of the year, if temps drop below 70 degrees, your colony may stop reproducing altogether. Larva may die off below 60. Beetles can survive 60 degrees just fine, they just won't reproduce. Their preferred temperature is close to 80 Fahrenheit or 26 Celsius for best growth and survivability. Now let's move on to pupa. When selecting larva to force pupation, it is best to choose your largest and fattest after a fresh feeding. In my first video, I used a banana, but I have found moisture content of the food and correct larva size is what really matters. So the previously mentioned foods are better as they are less likely to grow mold. The ideal larva size is 1.5 to 2 inches in length and 5 millimeters wide. If fed and selected by the recommended size, you will have a 99% pupation rate and rarely ever have to put a worm back. Next, we need to isolate them. I personally use condiment cups from the dollar store. Do note that if you have structures within your colony, such as egg flats, there is the possibility of pupation occurring as larvae of size will do their best to isolate themselves on top of it and begin the pupation process. After isolation, it can take one to two weeks for the larva to curl into a seat. Once in this state, the larva will not move much and will be in almost a stasis-like state. Light does not matter, they can be in a lit room with no tops on. Isolation is the only common factor across all methods of forced pupation. I used to keep them in a dark place, but I found it doesn't matter and they will still pupate regardless of the condition of their isolation, if they are of size. About one week after their C shape is assumed, they will transform into a pupa, where it can take another two weeks for them to complete the process and become a beetle. Now to the beetles. Once they hatch from their pupa state, they are very, very weak. They will not move much and will oftentimes be found on their backs. They are extremely soft in this state, so care when handling them. Over the coming week, the beetle will change from a whitish yellow to a red to a black. About two weeks after the beetle is hatched, they are sexually mature and have the strength to breed, which starts the cycle anew. Let's move on to breeding and sexing. The easiest part of the process is their breeding, which all you have to provide is a moisture source such as veggies or water jellies and have males and females. Males and females can be told apart by their face as there is sexual dimorphism. The face of the male has a C-shape or a mustache near its mouth as seen right here. Females have a flat line like the sea horizon near theirs. If you look closely and carefully, you can easily tell the two apart. Mating occurs often. Not long after, females will begin laying eggs. Their clutches seem to be around 20. I have not exactly tested this yet, however, some of the clutches of visible eggs, like the one right here, their clutches are not big, but they lay multiple sets. Now let's talk about egg collectors. Females will lay eggs in the substrate or on structures within their enclosure. The most efficient way that I have found to collect their eggs is through an egg collector. You can easily make one with corrugated cardboard stacked on top of each other, fastened together through glue or by tape. Females prefer to lay their eggs in crevices, so the holes in the cardboard are perfect for this. I suggest making multiple sets of these and rotating once a week. You can also leave nothing in the container and let them lay their eggs in the substrate. However, you risk the other eggs being destroyed by tiny larvae seeking moisture sources, and you want to have your eggs hatching all at similar rates, without there being larvae in the substrate already. Both methods are viable. I prefer the egg collectors, which does make it a little bit more hands-on, but will yield better results. If you do not 
use egg collectors, I suggest using a sifter. They're large enough to allow the substrate to pass, but not the beetles. Pour it in the sifter and replace the bedding. You may find egg clusters stuck to the bottom of the container. You can just leave them. You risk damaging them if you brush them as they are soft. If you do want to try to get them all out, you can use something like a makeup brush. Last on our list guys is enclosure. I use a one square foot bin, five inches high. This can house around 100 beetles without an issue, which is normally the number I stick to. I no longer use mesh bottom enclosures for these guys. It works best for mealworms, but not for superworms. Egg collectors or letting the eggs be laid in the substrate without the screened bottom seem to work best. Ventilation is extremely important if you intend to cover the tops of the enclosures. While feeding, humidity builds up and water can condense on the sides of the enclosure and run down into the substrate, leading to extremely high chances of mold. I prefer to leave lids off when feeding. If you choose to cover them, make sure there are a lot of vent holes to allow the excess humidity to escape. Alright guys, that about wraps it up. Everything you need to know about breeding these little critters. I hope I did the topic justice and made a better, more informative video than the first. If you have it in your critter loving heart, give this video a like, a subscribe, and hit the bell icon for more videos in the future like this. And as always, from the gizzards and I, have a wonderful day.